Good morning, good morning, good morning. morning. Well, are you glad to be in God's house this morning? Amen. Sarah, come here real quick before you come up here. If you are a part of the the, the prayer group, text group, I want you to raise your hand. Sarah is going to give you a list of who is in that group and what their phone numbers are. So if you're in that group, raise your hand so she can give you one of these, all right? That way everybody has it and you know who's who in there, okay? So, and then you say, well, I don't know these names. Well, at least you know who said it, so. Karen, you're on the short list. I don't, I don't know. (laughs) Did I say that out loud? Oops. <laughs> yeah. Well, I could believe that. All right. Well, we've got some goings on today. Uh, tonight, in fact, at 6 o'clock. You need to be back here at 6 o'clock tonight. Uh, I'm telling you, you do not want to miss tonight. Uh, Reverend Tim Lanigan, who is the associate pastor at Southport, will be here. He's going to sing for us and lead worship. And if you have not heard Dr. J.K. Warwick preach, uh, you need to come hear him preach. He texted me last night uh, his scripture and the title of his sermon to put up on the screen. And I got glory bumps just reading what he's, what, what he's preaching from. So it is going to be fantastic. So be here tonight at 6 o'clock. Our entire zone, all 10 churches are going to get together tonight. And uh, be here, Dr. Wangler is going to be here tonight, our district superintendent. So um, big goings on when even the DS wants to be here for, uh, for the preaching. So uh, we're looking so forward. And then after the service tonight over in the Family Center, we're going to have an afterglow. Um, we used to call them snacking yaks when I was little, but apparently that doesn't sound appealing. So um, we're going to call it an afterglow. And if you haven't signed up to bring anything, do not fret. The list is still out there for you to sign up. Uh, so that, take care of that, if you will, uh, so we can have a, a good assortment of just snacks and finger foods and fellowship together tonight. So uh, that is when? Tonight. At what time? Making sure you all are listening. That's good. Uh, also, on the uh, information table in the foyer is a rough draft. Today is the last day. Understand that. Today is your last day to get your information correct in that book. If it goes, if we print those this week and they're incorrect, you cannot come to me next week and say, Pastor, my information's not right because you had two weeks. I told you last week, I'm telling you today, get that checked off. If everything's right, check it off. And uh, if it's not right, scratch out what's not right and uh, write in there what uh, needs to be there. So make sure you get that taken care of today because we're going to print those hopefully this week. Uh, Family ministry night, Wednesday night, fellowship breakfast next Sunday or next Friday. How about game night? We missed it this past Friday because we were in Colorado, uh, but we will have it this coming Friday night at six o'clock in the family center next Sunday evening. Uh, You are invited to help us celebrate Sarah's 14th birthday. Yeah, so um, her uh, her birthday is the 29th, but we're going to have a little cake and ice cream party for her next next Sunday night at five o'clock in the Family Center. Uh, So you're welcome to come to that. NYI NDI conventions in the bulletin. District assemblies in the bulletin. If you're delegates to that, make sure you pay attention to those times or you'll miss the bus. And then uh, Women's Ministry Spring Banquet will take place Saturday, May 25th at 1130. I know that says at 11, uh, but it's at 1130. All right. Everything clear as mud. Woohoo! Are we ready to worship? I am just excited today. I'm tired, but you know what? God's faithful, isn't he? 
And uh, we're praising God. We, uh, Greta and I haven't drove straight through from Colorado to Indiana in a while. And I'm convinced they keep moving Colorado further away. Uh, the older I get, the harder that is to drive. So, uh, But we were able to make it. We didn't have a single problem along the way. Um, and uh, God was just faithful. So we're glad to be back this morning. And I told Greta, I might not leave this property for about um, six weeks. I'm not sure. <laughs> Figured it up. Nine days, in nine days, I was in ten states and drove 3,337 miles. I don't want to go anywhere at all, ever again. So um, if you all see that Pastor became a homebody, that's why. So that's, uh, but thank you all for your prayers. Uh, the funeral was just a great tribute to Greta's aunt. And um, like I said, we had a great trip. So thank you for your prayers. We're back and we're ready to go after a couple of naps. That would be good too. So let's open with a word of prayer this morning. Father, we do thank you again for the opportunity we have to be in your house. Lord, would you just lead and guide everything said and done in this service. May it all bring you glory, and may our hearts and lives be changed forever. We'll give you the praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand as we sing. your prayer this morning. He'll meet you there. Isn't that good? You may be seated. As I am, I come to thee without one plea. That is good. Isn't it? Man, that's just good. Take all of them, Lord. Amen? All right, Lord, take all my money. Here you go. Ushers, come. <laughs> we'll receive this morning. 
tithe and offering. He's the one that gave it to us anyway, right? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this act of worship, Lord, where we can give back just a small portion of how you have blessed us. Lord, lead and guide, bless the gifts and the givers, and we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody here glad he's touched you this morning? Anybody have the joy since he has? Stand as we sing it together. It's the best, one of the best hymns I think ever been written. I'm out. How are you all singing that? He touched me. Oh, he touched me. That second verse says, since I met this blessed Savior, since he cleansed and made me whole, That there's something to shout about. But that next line says, I will never cease to praise him. 
In fact, I'll shout it while eternity rolls. Folks, if that doesn't start a stirring down in your soul this morning, I don't know what will. So I want you this morning, I want you to sing that and, and think about the words. Don't just sing it. But think about these words because everybody in this room this morning has that testimony. Don't we? If you know Jesus today as your personal Lord and Savior, you have this testimony. And since he cleansed and made you whole, well, that ought to make us never cease to praise him and to shout it while eternity rolls. I'm going to tell you this morning, sing it like you mean it this morning. Sing it like you know what that's talking about, all right? Since I met this blessed For just a moment, he's here. <laughs> oh, it's starting to feel pretty good in here. <laughs> you see, in the presence of Jehovah, <laughs> God Almighty and the Prince of Peace, <laughs> have you found it to be true that troubles vanish in his presence? <laughs> have you found that your heart can be mended in his presence? There's nowhere else I can go and have that happen. Nowhere else that I can run to when I've got troubles. Nowhere else that I can run to when my heart hurts. When it's burdened under the cares of life and everything going on in it. I'm so glad today that he comes and allows us to stand in his presence today in the presence of the king <laughs> as we go to prayer this morning well, I want us to sing this chorus one more time 
And Courtney, you'll get this. I want us to hold the TV this time. Maybe you say, Pastor, I'm not a hand raiser. That's okay. We're going to go about right here. That is surrender. Lord, here I am in the presence of Jehovah, God Almighty and Prince of Peace. Here is my troubles today. Here's my heart today, God. I'm in your presence. Take me. Take all of me. You know what I need right now, Father. Here it is. Let him do it this morning. Let him touch you. He's here this morning. In the presence of Let him visit with you for a minute. Father God, we thank you today that we can stand in the presence of Jehovah, the God Almighty and the Prince of Peace. Thank you, Jesus, that you made us worthy, that you brought us near by your precious blood. Thank you, Father, that we can come, Lord, knowing full well all the things going on in our lives and in our hearts knowing full well that you know all those things as well. Father, may we just come and lay them before you today. Father, come in a mighty and a powerful way. Touch hearts and lives today. Father, we thank of some special requests today. We pray for Carolyn Berry, Father. You know what's going on in her body, and dear God, we pray for a special touch from the great physician, Father that you would just minister her right there in the hospital room, that, Father, they would be able to get things straightened out. Father, we know she's looking forward to coming home, and we just pray that you would touch her today. Father, we pray for Randy's dad, Lord, with the, uh, the high blood pressure this morning, Father, and uh, there's a little bit of a stubborn streak, it sounds like there. Father, would you just touch him today? Lord, be in the midst of that situation. Touch him physically, Lord, I pray. Father, would you just minister in a mighty way to each heart and life today in the remainder of our time together. Bless and guide everything that's said and done, Father. I pray, Lord, as we go into the sermon this morning, that you hide me behind the cross of Calvary once again. And Father, may the Holy Spirit do his job this morning, Lord, through me, I pray. Father, we thank you and praise you again for the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place. And we give you the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. May be seated. Praise his sweet holy name. I am so thankful this morning. I'm so thankful this morning for you. You realize this morning that the Holy Spirit couldn't come in this way unless you let him. So when I have nationally known gospel groups that stand on our stage and after the service they say pastor 
we are so thankful. We felt the presence of the Holy Spirit in ways that we don't hardly ever feel it. I say, well, it's got very little to do with me, but it's got everything to do with us. Just letting God do his thing. I don't know about you, but I'm glad this morning that he still wants to meet with us. Amen. That he still comes by and touches our hearts and allows that sweet spirit just to min- just to mingle with us for a little while. I'm thankful for that today, and I'm thankful that you all are willing to say, Lord, we're going to get ourselves out of the way and just let you do it. And, uh, boy, that doesn't happen everywhere, trust me. Uh, so I, I brag about our church a lot, and uh, with, with good reason, because I'm thankful God's still here. Amen. Uh, the story was told one time of, of uh, a church that was very much just kind of laid back. Nobody got excited about anything. Uh, by all intents and purposes, it was a dead church. It said uh, a person sitting on the center aisle had a massive heart attack and fell out into the, to the center aisle on the floor. And when paramedics came, they went to the wrong person. I'm glad we don't have that problem here. Amen. I'm thankful for that. 3,337 miles. I visited, of course, Indiana. I've been in Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee. That was the first trip. And then Indiana to Illinois. Missouri, Kansas, and Colorado. And then our aunt's funeral was in the northern, northeastern part of Colorado. So uh, the quickest way to come home took us up through Nebraska, and then Iowa, and then Missouri, and Illinois, and Indiana. Ten states in nine days. Let me tell you what I did on 3,337 miles, I prayed a lot. I prayed a lot for you. Friday night, we, we left the, the straight from the funeral about 4 o'clock our time here. And uh, Greta kind of was dozing in and out, and that was needed because she had to drive the late shift. But while she was asleep and the kids were, I don't know, they were on their devices doing something. They would not, my kids would not survive road trips like we took as kids. I'm telling you, they would not survive um, without having something to do, you know. We made up things to do, right? Um, How many of you ever played the alphabet game where you're looking for the, you know, looking for all the letters on the signs, right, or license plates and I'm telling you, if truck, trucking companies, the companies that make the trailers do not start putting air ride equipped back on their trailers, I'm going to lose my mind because you cannot ever find a queue. And you used to be able to rely on that. All of them said air ride equipped right on the back of the trailer, right? But they were back there, and I had some good old southern gospel music playing, and I just turned it down for a little bit. The sun was setting uh, behind me, and and I just started praying. I said, Lord, I don't know what the folks in my church are going through today, but I know you're able. doesn't matter what it is. So uh, about a midnight or so, we stopped for gas, and and, uh, Greta looked at me. She says, I'm ready if if you want to go get some if you want to try to get some sleep. I said, okay. So she drove for a few hours, and then about four, four or so, she stopped for gas, and and uh, we switched seats, and she went back to sleep. The kids were finally asleep. And um, as we were coming through uh, eastern Illinois, um, I hate driving through that state. Um, I hate it more than Kansas. Kansas is boring, but Illinois just, like, it doesn't end. It just keeps going. 
But as I got to eastern Illinois, the sun began to come up. And then God laid you on my heart again. And uh, most of you are doing a really good job of staying put. So I went pew by pew. I said, Lord, I don't know what they're going to face today, but be with them. Comfort them. Encourage them that it's okay. It's all going to be okay. Well, then the Lord decided that um, we would talk about our struggles this morning. Anybody in the room this morning ever faced struggles in your life? Yeah? Those of you who didn't raise your hand, God bless you. You must be doing something right. (laughs) I don't know about you, uh, but struggles are dime a dozen, it seems like, doesn't it? There's always something going on, always something new that God just allows to happen. As we were driving out, uh, Doug, I had a good uh, Doyle Lawson and Quicksilver CD in. Uh, and we were listening to that, and, and Doyle Lawson did a song years ago that says, Nothing can touch me that doesn't pass through his hands. And I love that song because it reminds me that no matter what we face, God has already approved it. He already knows about it. He already has provided a way of escape out of it. And I don't have to worry about it anymore. Isn't that good? Nothing can touch us that doesn't pass through his hand. And that's good news. But we're us, right? All right. We're going to get real for a second. How many of you worry? Anybody worry around here? Anybody worry so much about things that you chew your fingernails off? Yeah? Somebody? Yeah? Anybody get so worried that uh, your doctor says if you don't quit having so much stress, you're going to get an ulcer? I know folks who have literally worried themselves into health problems because of just the constant worry and ah. Uh, now, we're good Christian folks, so we don't like to call it worry because we know worry is sin. Uh, so we say, well, I'm not worried about it, Pastor. I'm just concerned. <laughs> okay. It's still worry. How many of you have ever had moments that something comes along and you immediately, it's not even worry, It's panic. You ever had anything happen where you immediately begin to panic about it? And you have that look on your face. What am I going to do? You say through bated breath at that because it sucker punched you. When you get that phone call from the doctor that isn't a good report. When you go out to start the car and it won't start. (laughs) Bruce and and Golda, bless their hearts, they have had brake issue after brake issue after brake issue on their van. And it's just over and over and over again. And you go and you're doing these things and all of a sudden life comes out of nowhere and sucker punches you. Rose, you wake up and there's water everywhere. Yeah? That's one, (laughs) right? But when panic hits, what do we do? Well, most of us panic. So let's start off with the definition of what is panic. You might be surprised to find out that it's very simple. It is a sudden, overpowering fright. That is what panic is. You all know that 
Our middle child, Aaliyah, any time that there is a severe thunderstorm warning or a tornado watch or tornado warning, she panics. She freaks out. And I mean, she got tears welled up that could just spill out of there at any time. And I have to assure her, it's going to be okay. How many of you have ever had that when you just fall asleep and you have that falling dream? And you jerk, and you're laying there, and you're like, oh! You know, you panic because all of a sudden you go from this dream to reality to reality, and you're like, oh, oh! And it takes you a couple minutes to wind back down so you can go to sleep, right? Panic is a sudden, overpowering fright. Now listen this morning. We're going to read of several instances here when panic hit. And what happened in the midst of it? Mark chapter 4 is where we will read first. Mark chapter 4, starting at verse 35. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him, him along, just as he was, in the boat. And there were other, also other boats with him. A furious squall came upon them, and waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still not have any faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this, that even the wind and the waves obey him? I want to start off in that first verse, of verse 35, of what happened here. Jesus looked at them and said, let us go over to the other side. Let me give you just this mini sermon inside of the big one, okay? When Jesus has a plan, don't worry about what happens on the way. He said, let us go over to the other side. The master of all things said, hey, we're going to the other side. He didn't say anything about what was going to happen. And you notice that Jesus wasn't the first bit concerned about anything that was going to take place on the journey to the other side of the lake. Not one time. In fact, he was so not worried about it that he went down into the stern and went to sleep. He is down there in this storm of all storm of all storms. Now, mind you, these guys were fishermen. They were used to storms. They were used to what to do when they, when they were out on the lake fishing and storms would come up. They knew what to do. But this storm was different. It was so different, in fact, that they were all losing their minds. It's funny sometimes. How many of you, when you read this, it says that the disciples... They went down into the, to the stern, and Jesus is laying on the cushion, right? And you read it, that they went and they said, Master, do you not care that we're going to perish, right? Can I tell you something? It wasn't anything like that. It wasn't anything like that. In fact, they went down, and I believe they grabbed Jesus by the, the breast of his collar and went, Jesus! Don't you care? Don't you know what's going on out here? What are you doing asleep? We're going to die! And I believe that Jesus did that. Oh, huh. how many of you just loved it when your kids, Travis and Amanda, when they come in in the middle of the night and you're dead to the world and they touch you and you look and they're right there. Ah! Right? Oh. I lose about six years off my life every time that happens. 
I believe Jesus was startled. And I believe as he listened to them freaking out, he went, went up on the stop, uh, on the, the top of the boat. Peace be still. Immediately, it was quiet. And then he looks at him. And if I'm putting this, remember we talked about Adam language the other day. If I'm putting this in Adam language, he goes, what is wrong with you? Why do you still not have faith? You know who I am. You know what I've done. And you know what I'm capable of. Why are you freaking out? What is wrong with you? I love that question because Jesus threw a dagger. He said, what is your issue? You know all of this. And if I'm down there sleeping and not worried about this, what's your problem? I wonder what would have happened if the disciples had just had faith. You know? Like, legit, I want to know if they had spoke to the storm and reminded the storm who was on board their boat. Whew. Yeah, I like that, Sherry. Think about it. We're going to read of another instance here in Matthew chapter 14. A different storm, a different time. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side <laughs> while he dismissed the crowd. I love this because he told them to go on. To me, I'm going to be going, wait a minute, he's doing something. <laughs> What's he doing? After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat, a considerable distance from the land, Buffeted by the waves because the wind was great against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. And you know, this is so like us. They immediately resorted that it was a ghost. It's a ghost, they said to each other, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. And then here's, oh, here, here, here's Adam. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, Come. Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But, Remember what but does. When he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. <laughs> so Jesus sends us out. We're out here on the boat. We're out here minding our own business, just doing what the Master told us to do. And the storm comes up, and it's starting to get pretty crazy out here. And then all of a sudden we see a figure off in the distance and we assume it's a ghost because we're crazy and don't remember that we got Jesus on our side. Uh, so we're out here worrying and we're going, oh, it's a ghost. Ah! And it says they cried out in fear. Well, what is panic again? A sudden overpowering fright. The disciples began to panic. Do you notice it just took the words of their master? Do not be afraid, it is I, Jesus said. <laughs> now they could have kept freaking out, kept screaming and kept hollering and screaming like a bunch of schoolgirls, or 
it says here that they believed that it was him. Peter, God love him, everybody wants to throw stones at Peter for what takes place next. I commend Peter because he had the faith to get out of the boat in the first place. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you. It says he climbed out of the boat and he walked on the water toward Jesus. <sighs> but then he was distracted. Then he sa it says that when he saw the storm, If he would have just kept his eyes on Jesus, he would have walked all the way out to him. Are you, are, are you catching what I'm throwing at you this morning? Are you understanding that as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus, doesn't matter the size of the storm or how noisy the storm gets or anything about the storm at all? It does not matter. But Peter, when he took his eyes off of Jesus, began to sink, and he panicked. Lord, save me! He cried. And it says immediately Jesus caught him by the hand and pulled him up. I don't think that walk back to the boat was very happy. Parents, have you ever had an unhappy walk with your kids? Mamas, y'all have this knack for getting that fingernail in the bottom of that earlobe and dragging kids. I can't do it near as well as any mama. My, my mama could grab a hold of that ear, and you knew she meant business. And I believe Jesus, it wasn't a, why did you doubt, Peter? I said, what is wrong with you? You were doing fine until you took your eyes off of me. You have little faith. Why can't you get this? It says when they climbed back into the boat, the storm stopped. <sighs> when panic hits. When panic hits, it seems... It is then that we are so quick to cry out to Jesus. When, if we would have just been crying out to him all along, we probably wouldn't have been in the mess mentally, emotionally, and spiritually that we're in because we allowed ourselves to look at the storm rather than the master of the storm. So many times we get so overwhelmed by whatever is happening that we have this tendency to think, oh, well, God, you might not be big enough to handle this one. Pastor, I, I don't say that. Do you? Because when you worry, oh, pastor is about to get mean. Because when you worry about it, you're questioning the sovereignty of your God. You are questioning whether or not he's big enough to take care of that issue in your life. Whew. Well, I can't believe you'd say that to me this morning, preacher. What is wrong with you? If that's your attitude, I would dare say you probably have done this a time or two. You may be there right now saying, God, what about this storm in my life? What are we going to do? Why aren't you listening? Do you see this? And he's going, yeah, yeah, I see it. I'm just waiting for you to hush long enough to realize that I'm the God of this problem too. Just like I was the last time and the time before that, 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 and that, and that, and that, and that. What more do I have to do? Jesus looks at them, he says, why do you still not have faith? What's wrong with you? 
There's a lot of people I'd like to look at and say that. Amen? What is wrong with you? Like, There's a lot of Christians, and I don't know if it's because I'm getting older and I'm getting more tired of us playing games with God, but I can tell you that the older I get and the longer that I walk this journey, I look at a lot of Christians and say, what's wrong with you? This trial does not define you. This trial does not define the power of your God. So what is wrong with you? Why are you acting like this is going to overcome you? Why are you panicking about something that you have no business panicking about in the first place? God allowed this trial. Why? Maybe it's to increase your faith in Him. Maybe, just maybe, it's so you'll keep your eyes on Him instead of looking at the storm this time. I think we go into our our issues in life with good intentions. I do. But then when the storm actually comes and the boat's rocking and it looks like we're going to sink. Anybody ever heard a song called The God on the Mountain? Yeah, I think we've all probably heard that song somewhere back through the years. The second verse says, you talk of faith when you're up on the mountain. But the talk comes so easy when life's at its best. But it's down in the valleys of trials and temptations. That's when faith is really put to the test. That's when it really matters that you sing that chorus and you believe what you're singing. For the God on the mountain is still God in the valley. When things go wrong, he'll make them right. And the God of the good times is still God in the bad times. The God of the day is still God in the night. Do you believe that in your trial? Do you believe it enough that when Jesus calls you, come to me, even though the storm of your life is raging beyond what you've ever experienced before in your life, that you're willing to get out of the boat and watch what he is telling you to do. Are we willing to really sing? That's when faith is really put to the test. I know you're the God on the mountain. I know that you're the same God in the valley that when things go wrong, you'll make them right. How do I know that? How do you know that this morning? Because he's done it before. The writer of Hebrews tells us that our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if God brought you through last week, last month, last year, what makes you think he's not going to now? Don't allow... uh, let Let me get close to you for a second. Do you realize that panic... Panic is a scheme of the devil. It is. If he can get your focus off of Jesus and onto your problem by an overpowering sudden fright, then he's done his job. He has taken your eyes off of Jesus. And you, listen, what happened when Peter looked at the storm? He sank. Can I give you some good news this morning? If you take your eyes off Jesus, you're going to sink. The problems of your life will overpower you. They will. And you will cry out in panic. The devil will get you there. Lord, help me. What am I going to do? I'm so glad that he doesn't stop coming and grabbing a hold of us every time I've ever called on him. Back in the 90s, uh, there was a lady in contemporary gospel music, uh, contemporary Christian music, by the name of Nicole C. Mullen. You probably know Nicole C. Mullen for singing, I Know My Redeemer Lives, yeah? One of her lesser known, but my absolute favorite Nicole C. Mullen song says, When I Call on Jesus. 
all things are possible. I can mount on wings like eagles and soar. When I call on Jesus, mountains are going to fall. And he'll move heaven and earth to come and rescue me when I fall. In John chapter 6, we read another storm where Jesus told them, it is I, do not be afraid. Mark chapter 5 and Luke chapter 8. <coughs> Excuse me, I shouldn't breathe and swallow at the same time. <coughs> there, we read about a woman with an issue of blood who had gone <coughs> to every doctor available. They couldn't help her. She spent all of her money. Nobody could help her. In a moment of panic, she went to where Jesus was and said, if I could but touch the hem of his garment, what could he do for me? <laughs> and you know what happened? You know what happened. That medical issue she had faced for 12 years was done immediately. Mark chapter 5, we read of Jairus' daughter, who was sick and getting ready to die. And he went to Jesus and he said, Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, my daughter is going to die. I need you to come and heal her. <clears throat> In a moment of panic, he ran to Jesus. John chapter 11, we read about Mary and Martha sending word to Jesus that his friend Lazarus was about to die. And Jesus waited four days, and Lazarus died. And oh, Martha, God loved Martha. I love Martha. She ran to where Jesus was, and she goes, If you would have only been here, but he's already dead, and you're late. What did Jesus say to her? Your brother's not dead. He's just asleep. And Martha, still not getting the drift here, kind of like the disciples, kind of like you and I. Martha, I believe she probably chastised him from wherever that he met her on the road till they got to the, to the grave. Right? She just, ah, I, where have you been? Why did, he was sick, and we sent for you, and you waited four days. Where have you been? You know, if you just give me a little bit of your power, I might be able to heal somebody. You can just kind of envision it, can't you? Up to the point that Jesus looked at them and said, roll the stone away. She's still going. But Lord, he's been there four days. And I love, I love the King James. He stinketh. <laughs> he stinketh. That's what I tell my kids when it's shower night. You stinketh. Go get, go, go get unstinketh, please. She still doubted him up to the point he called for the stone to be removed from the door. And it wasn't until he called Lazarus out that she went, oh! Maybe you really are who you said you were. You know, in both of the storms that we read about, the disciples both times said, who is this? Maybe he really is Lord that the winds and the waves obey him. <laughs> yep, maybe, just maybe he really is. 1 John 4, 18 tells us there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love. Do you realize <coughs> that loving the Lord Jesus Christ and allowing him to be Lord of your life will drive out panic? It will drive out fear in your life. How does that happen? Well, it's really simple. It's this thing called, Lord, here's everything I am. Here's everything I have. Come what may, I trust you. I give it to you. I know you've got this. Horatio Spafford, in the mid-1800s, 
Horatio sent his wife and his children back to England for vacation. Now, Horatio was a very wealthy businessman who trusted the Lord. A couple of days after he sent his family on that ship back to England, he got a telegram that said that the ship had sunk. And for the next few days, he had no idea. He had thought everybody was dead. Until he got a two-word telegram about three days after the shipwreck from his wife who said, arrived alone. Now, mind you, Horatio had three girls on that boat who perished with the shipwreck. Just a few months earlier, he had lost his son to polio. Horatio knew he needed to go to his wife. So he boarded a ship, and as they were going across the Atlantic, the captain of the boat came to him, and he said, Mr. Spafford, I I don't know if you even want to know, but we are over the place where your kids are. Horatio went out onto the deck of the boat, He grabbed a pen and a paper. He wrote the words to what I think is the greatest hymn ever written. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way. When sorrow, like sea billows roll. You know, I can't imagine losing one kid, much less all of them. And then he wrote some words that just rock me to my core every time I think of that hymn. Whatever my lot. (laughs) Whatever I'm facing. Whatever I'm going through. Whatever you have permitted, Lord, you have taught me to say, it is well It is well with my soul. (laughs) Oh, my friends, I don't know what your lot is right now. I don't know what your lot is going to be next week, next month, or next year. But can I tell you that the one who calmed the storm on both of those instances, the one who asked them to come to him walking on the water, is the same one who is calling to you, keep your eyes on me, I've got you, don't worry, don't panic, don't fear, I've got you. And that's all you need to know. It is well, it is well with my soul. Fran, I think you've got it open, don't you? 554, oh man. You or Linnell, somebody come play. I don't care. Play rock, paper, scissors until somebody gets it. I can't play it, so stand with me this morning. I want us to sing that verse and the chorus of that as we leave today. And if you, listen, if you are here this morning and you say, Pastor Adam, the storm in my life is awfully noisy, and I'll admit it, I've taken my eyes off of Jesus and I'm sinking. And I just want to allow him to pull me out and to instill in me a trust that it's going to be okay. You know, the hardest part about it sometimes as Christians is admitting it. It is. Because we're like, well, man, I can't go up there, Pastor. Uh, You know, what's Doug going to think of me? What's Judy going to think if she sees me go to the altar? What, what's Linda going to say? If she, well, wonder what's wrong with that person. 
Can I tell you this morning, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. We have been in the presence of Jehovah this morning, and he is here and he wants to help you in your storm right now. If you'll let him. That's the key. He gave Peter the instructions, just keep your eyes on me, walk to me. Didn't say anything about paying attention to the storm, did he? So how about it this morning? Do you have that going on in your life? Don't worry about what anybody else thinks. If they start thinking, then they need to be with you at the altar. Amen. Well, I just know that they're going to call, and then there's going to be a little gossip. They need to be at the altar, too, because gossip sin. Oh, that's another sermon for another day. You worry about you this morning. You worry about you and Jesus. That's all we need to worry about and focus on this morning. So if you say, Pastor, I need to just give it all to Jesus. I want to lay it all down and let him get rid of the panic and the worry in my life. I'm giving it to him. Then you come as we sing this morning and walk out of here different than when you came in. Don't pick it back up and take it home with you. You gave it to the Lord. Don't be an Indian giver. Lay it down and leave it there. So how about it this morning? How about it this morning? Is it well with your soul? If it's not, let's get it well. Amen? It's going to happen today. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my love. Thou hast taught me to say, It is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. third verse says my sin oh the bliss aren't you glad of this glory <laughs> my sin not in part <laughs> that's good news this morning but the whole is nailed to his cross And I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. It is well with my soul. Aren't you glad today that you can say that? Friends, go out of here today knowing that your God is in control. Whom shall I fear? (laughs) Nobody. He's got it under control. Father, thank you today. Thank you that we can sing that song and mean it. Whatever my lot, whatever happens, 
I can say it is well with my soul. For I know you're in control. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, today for the victory that only comes through you. Lead and guide our day, Father, we pray. Lord, may we come back tonight ready to worship with our zone churches. And Father, we're looking forward to a great outpouring of your spirit yet again. Father, we thank you and we praise you and we thank you. Oh, Lord, we can't thank you enough. And it's in the matchless and holy name of Jesus that we pray today. And all God's people said, amen. Be back at 6 o'clock tonight.